It is a great pleasure to welcome you this evening, as well as those friends who are attending via live media to our annual uh, Mati Egon lecture. This is always a very special occasion and event as it commemorates uh, the legacy of our founder, a truly admirable woman, inspiring, kind, generous, supporting all those in need, and of course, a great uh, patron of classics. Uh, well, since we have so many new people in this hall and uh, new friends on Zoom, uh, we would like to start the evening by introducing you to our charities, aims and missions by a short video. Welcome to the Greek Archaeological Committee UK Annual Mati Egon Lecture. The Greek Archaeological Committee, founded in 1986 by Mati Egon Xilas, is a British registered charity which promotes Greek archaeology in the UK and grants scholarships to Greek and Cypriot Greek first-class graduates of limited means to pursue postgraduate studies in leading UK universities. Each year, this lecture serves as a tribute to the memory of our founder, who was a source of inspiration and encouragement to all. Her philanthropy and generosity touched many lives. Her legacy continues to live on through the charity's scholarship fund and the past scholars who advanced Greek archaeology across the world. The elusive dream of studying at Oxford became a reality thanks to the generous support of the Greek Archaeological Committee UK as the committee's first scholar during my MPhil studies in 1993-1995 and later during the penultimate year of my DPhil studies in 2000. Studying in Oxford was undoubtedly a unique experience. Far from greatly enhancing my career opportunities, it certainly left a lifelong impression on my personality and the way I perceive this world. And all this became possible because of Mati Egon, the founder and first chair of the committee, who came into my life like a god fairy. And I mean this literally. I feel extremely lucky that I met her and learned through her attitude what is that really matters in this life. Her passion for knowledge, her kindness, her authentic concern for everyone will always be my lasting memory of her. Therefore, I greatly appreciate the efforts of everyone who safeguards and continues her legacy. I was one of the young scholars of the Greek Archaeological Committee UK in the years 2000-2003. I owe a great deal to Mrs. Matigon and the Greek Archaeological Committee UK. The committee generously sponsored my doctoral project on the Mycenaean cult of the dead, allowing me to become an expert in my field and subsequently pursue a successful academic career. I was a Greek Archaeological Committee UK and Mati Egon scholar from 1997 to 2001. Thanks to these grants, I was able to do my master's and PhD at the University of Sheffield and to become familiar with a different kind of archaeology than the one I had been used to back at Athens. My debt to both the Greek Archaeological Committee UK and Matt Egon is immense. And I was a Greek Archaeological Committee UK scholar between 2006 and 2011 during my master's and DPhil studies at the University of Oxford under the um, keen supervision of Professor Irini Lamos. It was thanks to the vision of Mati Egan and through her generosity and support that I, as well as um, an entire generation of archaeologists, succeeded to complete our studies in prestige universities of the United Kingdom and to continue serving the archaeology of Greece and Cyprus. This achievement and my academic career overall would not have been possible without the support of the Greek Archaeological Committee UK. 
I am truly in debt to the committee's founder, Mrs. Matty Egan, as well as to the patrons and academic advisors for the support and encouragement. Um, I also wish to congratulate the current president, uh, Dr. Theodoropoulou Polychroniadis, as well as all current members for continuing the legacy of Matt Egan and to express the wish that uh, this scholarship scheme that has supported uh, me as well as dozens of other students will continue to contribute to the flourishing um, of our field. You may recall that last year I gave the Matt Egan Memorial Lecture and that some 20 years ago, I was a recipient of a fellowship from the Greek Archaeological Committee. Over the past two decades, I came to appreciate immensely the contribution of this fellowship to the development of my studies and career. This is especially now that I'm in the US and I see that graduate students have guaranteed funding for five or six years. This is not the case in the UK and the Greek and Cypriot students who receive the support of the, in the fellowship from the Greek Archaeological Committee benefit immensely from the generosity. This not only helps shape a new generation of experts in Greek archaeology, but has a lasting contribution to the field at large. This is why the committee deserves our full support. I was a scholar of the Greek Archaeological Committee UK between 2010 and 2013 for three academic years during my PhD at University College London. The financial support of the committee, particularly during the height of the Greek crisis, was invaluable. What is more, the trust that Matty placed in us scholars made the committee feel like an extended family. I have been a recipient of the AG Leventis Foundation Scholarship from the Greek Archaeological Committee UK in 2012 upon embarkation of my postgraduate studies at the University of Sheffield. I was very fortunate to receive that one-year scholarship, for without it, it would not have been possible to undertake my Master's of Science in Archaeological Materials, that subsequently led to the completion of a PhD at the same institution and allowed me to further develop my training at the postdoctoral level and my current position at the University of Cyprus, as well as to establish myself in academia. I am deeply grateful to the Greek Archaeological Committee and its chair, Dr. Zeta Theodoropoulou Polychroniadis, for so kindly keeping our community of former and current scholarship recipients connected and for her overall achievements and efforts in promoting Greek archaeology. I have been a Matt Egon scholar back in 2017 to 18 when I completed the Master of Studies at the University of Oxford. The Matt Egon scholarship has not only been a vital part of my decision to study there. It introduced me to a welcoming community of true intellectuals with whom I shared my interests, my thoughts, even my doubts about Greek archaeology today. Gakug was really a safety net for my time in England. Back in 1999, I moved to London to embark on my postgraduate studies on the Greek Archaeological Committee UK scholarship. Over four academic years, I was able to complete my master's degree and finish research on my PhD, thanks to the J.F. Kostopoulos, Greek Archaeological Committee UK, and Matty Egan scholarships. As a scholar, I was invited to attend the important public lectures offered by the committee in London, and I was introduced to committee members and other eminent scholars and academics. Such was the attitude of openness and inclusion inspired by the committee's founder, the late Matty Egan Xilas. The current council, chaired by Zeta Theodoropoulou Polychroniades, honors Mati's valuable legacy in face of considerable adversity, continues to disseminate information on archaeological work in Greece, and awards scholarships to Greek and Cypriot Greek students doing postgraduate studies in the UK. I am proud to have been such a postgraduate student 
a Greek Archaeological Committee UK scholar myself. And I'm happy to be a committee member supporting such an admirable cause. To date, the Greek Archaeological Committee has granted 75 scholarships and delivered 63 public lectures. These scholarships are only possible through annual memberships and donations from individuals and institutions, 100% of which go towards the university fees of young, promising archaeologists, thus helping them fulfill their dreams. Support the Greek Archaeological Committee and help keep classical studies alive in the UK. This year, we are supporting uh, four scholars. We have two at Cambridge University, one at Oxford, and one at Warwick University. But of course, our work would not be possible without the generous sponsorship of our donors. And uh, the committee is very grateful to the A.G. Levendis Foundation, for its continuous support by granting an annual scholarship and for generously sponsoring this evening's event. We are moreover honored by the presence of the director of the foundation and other members of the Levendis family. I would also like to thank our other major donors, Mati Egon's children, Stamatia and Nicholas, as well as uh, our members whose subscriptions fund a further annual scholarship. Finally, a big thank you to all of you for attending this evening and supporting our fundraising event. We're very pleased to announce that we have raised over £5,500 for our scholarship funds through this evening's event. Thanks to all of you. And with that final thank you, let's turn our attention to the main event of the evening, to our prestigious speaker. Michael Wood certainly needs no introduction. Anyone anywhere with an interest in history knows his past work and his brilliant recently published book called In the Footsteps of Dufu, which is a, a chronicle of the life and work of one of China's greatest poets of the 8th century AD. Historian, broadcaster, author of numerous history bestsellers, charismatic presenter, he had been appearing on our TV screens for over 30 years. His and Rebecca Dobbs's Maya Vision television production company have made some of the world's most important stories accessible to a very wide public, often filming at great risk in remote and even hostile territories all around the world. We are honored to have Michael as a GAKU Council member and supporter of our mission and are deeply grateful to him and of course extremely eager to hear him unraveling the latest evidence on the tale of the Trojan War. Ladies and gentlemen, Michael Woods. Thanks very much, Seta. It's, uh, it's great to be here. And thank you all for supporting this, this very good cause. Um, and commemorating Matty, whose, whose luminous and beautiful presence is still an inspiration to us all. And as you've heard, uh, Gakuk's work supporting young scholars, but also promoting the classics 
and, and nurturing relations between Britain and Greece, which despite the blip last week, um, <laughs> are actually long and deep. When we talked about the subject for tonight's, um, for tonight's lecture, uh, the obvious one was the story of Troy. Um, it's got everything, you know, the drama of the story, the archaeology, text, topography, diplomatic. But having said that, I have to say at the very beginning, I feel a bit of an imposter standing in front of you here in such an audience because I'm not a specialist in the Bronze Age. I'm not an archaeologist. I'm not a specialist in Greek history. Uh, but as a filmmaker, I've made quite a few forays into, into Greek history. And, and one of those... Our 1985 series, it seems unbelievable to think it's that long ago now. I used to think it was a clerical error, but I can no longer claim that, I'm afraid. Um, that series and the book on Troy had quite an impact in the field, stirring up questions above all. And in fact, the fourth great excavator of Troy, Manfred Kaufmann, wrote me a letter not long afterwards saying it was reading the German translation of that that really convinced him that they should go back to re-excavate Troy. So it played a little part in that. And um, uh, those excavations began in 1988 with, um, at Besiktas and then in Troy itself in the 1990s and into the 2000s. They're still continuing now. And I'm going to talk about some of the amazing discoveries that they've made, fascinating discoveries that they've made, um, especially with the lower town of Troy, and wider discoveries about the topography of the whole Trojan plain. I'll, I'll talk about some of those tonight and show you slides. At the same time, there have been major new discoveries uh, on the Hittite side with the Hittite diplomatic archives in the late 1990s and 2000s. Uh, I, I should mention perhaps especially um, David Hawking's work here uh, on the geography of the Hittite empire, which is revolutionary, well, firmed up our tentative understanding of 40 years ago to now clarity about where many of the kingdoms of Western Anatolia were. Uh, and those, that scholarship has culminated in 2011 with the first complete edition of the Hittite tablets with translation, the Hittite tablets that refer to the Greeks, as we'll see. And in 2019, a, a huge volume devoted by a number of scholars to the to the uh, uh, the most important of all those texts, the Tawagalawa letter. We'll come to that later. Um, so in the last 30 years, the subject has grown exponentially. Um, and it's a great moment to attempt even a kind of popular overview. So tonight, I'm going to talk about an hour. And uh, I'm going to try and give you that overview. Uh, I'm going to try and tell the story of the discovery and excavation of Troy, then the story of the diplomatic archive of the Hittite Empire, in which real letters exist written by the kings of the Hittites to the kings of the Greeks, and now one letter has been identified as a letter from the king of the Greeks to the king of the Hittites. And then finally, we'll try and look with a few speculations about how we can combine that kind of evidence um, from the Hittite tablets and the archaeology to construct a possible, plausible story of what one imagines was one of several wars around Troy at that time. And in particular, perhaps, to see whether there are any clues in the Homeric text which might have come down from the late Bronze Age. So, the story itself. Um, well, you know, um, it never stops, does it? An incredible outpouring of books in recent times. Video games. My first slide was the Total War Troy video game. And uh, the most, most recent blockbuster, the Brad Pitt movie, my kids absolutely loved it. I per personally felt deeply disappointed that they hadn't approached something of the Bronze Age reality. You know, when, um, when Paris says to Helen towards the end, 
it's no good, Helen, I'm not a hero. <laughs> and, and, and Helen replies, it's not a hero, I want Paris, it's a man to grow old with. You, you kind of, uh, you could feel Homer turning in his grave, you know. They'd missed, that as they went off into the sunset together, they'd missed the cruel, ruthless, inevitable power of Homer's story. But then as a, a Hollywood producer said to me, uh, talking about the Alexander the Great movie, it's the negative ending problem that we face here when the good guys lose. So, um, uh, but um, uh, the story, I need hardly say, uh, very simply, the, the abduction of Helen, a thousand ships assembled to win her back, to make war in Anatolia, the ten-year siege, the final terrible denouement with the wooden horse, and the, and the destruction of the city, the killing of the men, the rape and enslavement of the women, those were the customs of Bronze Age warfare. And that's why ever since Troy has stood for perhaps all cities destroyed in war. Mariupol, Gaza. Ask me for an image of human civilization, said the Roman philosopher Seneca, and I'll show you the sack of a great city. But um, it's as well to remember at the start that Homer's story composed orally, perhaps, soon after 700 BC, on a much older oral tradition, is only one part of the tale. And many other, not only facets of the tale, but whole other narratives existed in the ancient world. The, the British Homeric scholar Walter Leaf in 1915, for example, um, untangled what he called the story of the great foray, Achilles' series of expeditions on the shores of Anatolia in Teuthrania, in Mysia, and especially on Lesbos. There are about a dozen references to this in the Iliad, some of them quite substantial little passages, all of which Leif argued, and everybody's accepted since, were part of an older alternative and other tradition of, of the narrative. And um, we might come back to that. So the famous pithos in Mykonos, I took this slide about 30 or 40 years ago, I think, um, created around the time Homer was composing, perhaps, independent of him, um, shows you that this narrative was already set rich, powerful narrative. Other parts of this pithos show terrified women and children waiting their fate. And here's the wooden horse. Um, and the Greeks never doubted that the Trojan War was a real war, and it took place in a real place. And the real place, um, just a simple map, of course, is what we call Troy today. Um, what was known in the classical period as Ilion, New Ilium under the Romans, but there wasn't any doubt of where it was, at least the immediate region of the Troad. But after the end of the classical world, people probably ceased living on the site in the 10th, 11th century. Up to that point, there'd been, it'd been a Christian bishopric even of, of Troy. But from then on, the site was lost and was, through the Middle Ages and the early modern period, began to be sought by Western travelers, but not only Western travelers, um, searching for the fabled city, which had, had become so famous in Western culture. And I've just put a couple of these in to show you. I hope you can see them at the back. This is the product of that first age of searching for Troy in the, the Enlightenment period, late 18th century. And these wonderful watercolors by William Gell, 
were um, published in 1804. And I love this picture because you can't get this picture today. It actually shows you the setting. There's Imbros on the shoreline, and peeping over the top of Imbros, Fengari, the mountain of Samothraki, which Homer says was the seat of Poseidon as he watched the Trojan War. And if you look at the map, you'd never believe that this could be, but it, when you stand on the, the site, it is true. Fengari is high enough, despite being so far away, that uh, you can see it from Troy. And on the other side, Tenedos, famous little island in the, in the whole story, of course, the Greek offshore base, and the plain of Troy below you, and the, the little bay on the, on the right of this close-up, Beshika Bay, which some scholars have thought is where the Greek epic tradition believed the Greek ship station to have been, and I'll come back to that. It was mapped 1840 by the British. You see the layout of the plain there, the two rivers that Homer refers to, the Scamander and the Simois, an alluvial plain, just like the Meander and other rivers in Western Anatolia. We now know, of course, had silted up a huge way from the Bronze Age. But um, I can't point to you, but can you see Ilium Novum in the middle of the picture? And above it, the writing Hisalik, fortress, and the little oval just to the left of the H is the, what we might call the Acropolis, the highest point of Hisalik. So in 1840, this is, this is what they knew of the site. Um, people had drawn it, Schwazer Gouffier, McLaren, Scotsman, editor of the Scotsman, founder of the Scotsman, in fact, who, who sketched it in 1822 and believed this might well be the site of Homeric Troy. And it was those clues that led Schliemann, Heinrich Schliemann, to the site in 1869. There's Schliemann, the fourth, of, fourth to the right of the, um, from the left of the, of the men standing up. Below him, with the hat and the beard, Frank Calvert, the British consul in the Dardanelles, who had persuaded Schliemann that this, not the preferred site, was the place. And um, and Schliemann's excavations started in 1870, and I, and I copied these pictures from the German Archaeological Institute in Athens. And uh, they're taken slightly later, but what they convey is a real sense of, well, Homer talks about steep Ilios, windy Ilios, the epithets that are given to these sites, but steep. And you can see it is, isn't it? Just look at that. There's the great trench that Schliemann drove through the mound in his belief that Troy must be early and deep in the mound. He smashed his way through later walls, which actually were classical walls. In fact, that there's, there's one of them about to go to get into the center of the mound where he found a third millennium BC, tiny little fortress with a ramp, which was shown to tourists at the time and still is, of course, still there. Um, but it didn't really add up to what Homer's Troy ought to be, as Schliemann thought. And look what he did to the hill. That's at the end of 1870 to 73 excavations. It's amazing, isn't it? Hundreds of workmen at a time, railway tracks, you know, they were, they were, what, what they removed, we don't quite know. Did they ever find and miss play tablets from an, a diplomatic archive from that we've no idea? I said to Kaufman, what about going through Schliemann's dumps? And he said, sadly, it would be too difficult, too much trouble. But that's what there was. 
So Schliemann ended his life 20 years after he first started digging without having found the link that told him this could be the Troy of the late Bronze Age. There he is in this last photograph with Dirkfeld, his young assistant, his hand on his shoulder, and Frank Calvert still there at the top. And it was Dirkfeld who made the great discovery. Schliemann had actually smashed through buildings of the late Bronze Age in order to get at that early site. And you can just see one here. You see on the left-hand side the slightly sloping, rather nicely built part of a house wall with the little insets. That's, that's from the Troy of the late Bronze Age. And it was in one of those that um, just before he died, Schliemann was shown pottery that was of the right period that could be connected with the Greek mainland. And uh, after his death, Dirkfeld came back. And this is, <laughs> this is Dirkfeld's photograph of um, after his famous season when he exposed what we think would be Homeric Troy. Can you see the, the triangular bit sticking up at the right-hand side? That's the original end of the hill. And the person standing on that outcrop right in the middle of the picture to the right of the tree, that's the original surface of the hill. And bottom left-hand side, you can see the remains of the great watchtower of Troy. And uh, that felt on the southern side of the hill, found the walls that now pretty much are, are, it is agreed if there if there's a, is a, a real Troy remembered in the poetry, this is it. You see the, again, the slightly sloping walls, the little insets, revetments. Homer does talk about the slight slope of the walls that made it easier for Achilles to race up in one moment of rage. There's Dirtfelt in his natty jacket on top. And uh, as you go around, still the remains of quite impressive structures. But it shows you how complicated the site was. The walls that the guy's leaning against in the left-hand side, they're Roman. So the Romans have used the old Bronze Age fortress and built new walls butting onto it, but re retained something from 13th century BC, which is the, um, which is the great watchtower in the center, which had a well in it and presumably a huge mud brick superstructure. So, and you can see again here how complicated it was with the Homer's Troy, if I can call it that, Troy six um, on the, on the left-hand side and the Hellenistic walling on the, on the right. So this is what Schliemann was, dealing with, and he had no archaeological training. And probably nobody in the 1870s really knew how to analyze this kind of stuff in the, with pottery dating in its infancy. But Dirtfeld had done it. Uh, he produced a magnificent volumes in 1902. And uh, this is how he untangled the mound. You can see the surface, the wall of Troy VI, the, the, the fine walls which Schliemann had demolished on the left, the classical temple of Athena visited by Al Alexander the Great on, on uh, where it must have stood. Schliemann's early and middle Bronze Age settlement in black and the surrounding, the remains of the, of the Homeric city, if we can call it that, on the... Uh, on the outside in, in red. He was an architect, Dirtfeld, and had a great eye for how buildings fitted together. But of course, he was also a, a romantic. And um, in the book, he not only included his beautiful architectural drawings, but um, this, this is what it looked like, he thought, the citadel of Troy. The the fig tree hill. Can you see Erineos Hugo, where the, where the um, uh, 
Trojan women had watched the, the warriors and named them going out to fight. The Skian Gate, looking out over the plain, the Dardanian Gate, looking on the plateau. Uh, he's, he's found home as Troy, literally, he believes. And people agreed. Walter Leaf, in his English version of this book, spoke of the... Uh, um, there was no doubt. We found Homer's Troy. Dirtfeld himself said our, our master Schliemann could never have imagined in his wildest dreams that we could actually have found the very place that fitted the Homeric text. Um, how far this fits the Homeric text, we'll come back to that. And he even drew a map to show us how the war might have gone. There's Troy, and he marks in interesting little points here. These are points which Homer scholars have ignored, really, right from the ancient world. In fact, the, um, the pool by the seashore, the stoma limne, was excised by some critics in the classical age because there was no feature like that on the Trojan plain. And they thought it must be a mistake. The pool by the shore, which according to Homer, had partly protected the Greek camp. The throsmos, the swelling of the plain. And Homer says it was only when you went over the throsmos that each side could see the other. Now there's no such feature like that on the Trojan plain, and there never has been. But carried away by his romantic vision of what he found, felt marked all these in and put the Greek camp right by the Dardanelles where, as has only really become apparent recently, it would have been impossible for the Greeks to have camped. But the war is fully imagined and that map of the war really um, survived until very recently. It does even still today in some, in some books. Now, we don't tonight have time to look at uh, what was happening on the mainland, but I must just very briefly point out that while these excavations were happening in Troy, of course, um, Schliemann had gone across to, um, uh, uh, to the mainland and done some amazing excavations at other places, or Komenos, uh, Tiryns, Mycenae, and there, Without a shadow of doubt, he had uncovered the world of the late Bronze Age that everybody agrees is distantly reflected in Homer. The great fortress, its inner and outer walls, the palace there, um, the great Tholos tombs, mid-13th century perhaps. This clearly was a moment when Mycenae was a great, powerful kingdom. As Homer says, Agamemnon of Mycenae was the, was the leader, the primus inter pares, the leader of the coalition that went to Troy. So Mycenae was especially important in the Homer tradition. And here, there was no doubt the architecture showed it was. Later palaces give us, uh, excavations give us a sense of what the riches of this uh, palace culture of the late Bronze Age um, we know how massively militarized society was. I mean, this is Tiryns. You see the, the bastions at the bottom of the picture here. It's so massively constructed. And Tiryns, Medea, uh, Argos, Mycenae are virtually within sight of each other. So this was a, a militarized society, um, which, of course, in the Greek tradition had combined under Agamemnon to sail to Troy. It was a society that had used the chariot in warfare. Um, it was a society whose warriors are depicted in, in, uh, in art of the time, the, the predecessors of the hoplites, if you can put it that way. And, uh, and of course, in Schliemann's time and later, a lot of their weaponry has been excavated. So when Homer talks about the the silver-studded sword, stuff like this. You, you, 
we can see them. So, and when Homer talks about the boar's tusk helmet, he's, he's remembering something which was no longer current in his time. You know, possibly a metrical fossil handed down by the bards over 500 years from when these things were still worn. So in the Homeric text, hints of that Bronze Age world. And that's the, it just a, gives you a rough sense of the world that was, by the early 20th century, was coming into focus of how people understood the Mycenaean age. But what was happening in Anatolia was another matter. And, uh, and to bring these two together, the Greeks and the Hittites, the Greeks and the Anatolians, we need to go to the empire of the Hittites. Uh, this is Boaz Koy, a bleak day, I've shot these. Uh, but the, the vista's too big to even encompass in a single picture, but these vast palace and town city site surrounded by huge gorges, the crags all around it topped by big, Cyclopean walled forts, some of them almost as big as the Greek palatial sites. Um, an enormous center, which really until the 19th century, nobody had any idea of the existence of the Hittites. It was only in the 1830s that Charles Texier had actually um, got to this place and explored it for the first time and, and written about it for a Western audience. And it was really only in the uh, from 1907 onwards, that the excavations here at what was called Hattusa um, had uh, revealed the nature of this big empire. Huge defensive. This is just one corner of a vast bastion running for about a quarter of a mile. Um, the chapels, uh, and all of these were mute, really, until uh, the language was deciphered. Um, that's the sort of gives you an idea of the size of the empire uh, towards 1300 BC, towards the same period of the Mycenaean, um, the Mycenae's preeminence, beginning to reach out towards the Aegean. The excavations that has Tushine 1907 turned up what they hadn't turned out in Greece, an enormous diplomatic archive. More than that, literature, letters, treaties, uh, an amazing catch of, of, of material, which continues today. These discoveries continue today. And, um, and when the Hittite language was deciphered by Hrosny in the First World War, it was discovered to be the, the earliest Indo-European language, and almost immediately, uh, whole new questions arose. This was an empire which had ruled from, at times, from the Aegean to Syria. They had fought battles with Ramses II and the Battle of Kadesh in 1275. They'd contested with the Babylonians and the Assyrians. They were a major, major power which had slipped entirely out of our consciousness in the intervening 3,000 years since its fall. And here they were, suddenly, coming right out at us. And the texts were astounding. And as scholars began to analyze these things from, um, from, nine, from the end of the First World War onwards, uh, some extraordinary readings were made. And I put a picture here of Emil Forer. He was... Um, Swiss Hittitologist, who was only in his 20s at that time. I mention it because although um, uh, you know, he was born in the early 1890s and he, his famous contributions to this debate were in the 1920s, I had a chance to talk with him. Um, he, he gave up on um, Hittite studies and ended up in El Salvador, of all places, in Central America. But uh, with a half thought in mind of those years ago that we might possibly talk to him about his role in this astounding story, uh, um, we rang him up and uh, 
had a brief word with uh, with Fora about his uh, his his uh, amazing story. In the end, we decided it was much too much money to send a film crew out to El Salvador for a very short interview. But Fora was the person who first drew attention to these astounding correspondences between the Hittite texts and Homer and the Greek. The most obvious and the very first one which struck Fora and a number of other scholars in the 1920s was that Homer calls the Greeks the Achaeans. And, Greek, and Greece itself, Achaewea, with the W in pre-classical Greek. And here was a powerful kingdom in the West, in the Hittite documents, called Achaea. Akiawa. And, and the Hittites had one god in particular, in, in, uh, and the, I'll come back to uh, Apollo in a moment. And in the, in, the, in the west of their empire were two place names which were most striking, Wilusa and Taruya, or Taruisa uncannily like Homer's names for Troy. Ilios, before the digamma was lost in classical Greek, Wilios, so Wilios, Wilusa, Troia, Taruya, Akewia, Achiawa. And these correspondences went further. A treaty was discovered for the king of Wilios whose name was Alexandus, and Homer's name for, alternative name for Paris, is Alexandros. And later scholars, this is not Fora, pointed out that other names in the Trojan story read much more plausibly in an Anatolian language, Paris, Paria, or Pariaziti, Priam, Pariamu. These, I mean, I've always felt that the common sense reading in history was usually likely to be the right one if there was nothing against it. But this was resoundingly rejected by especially the German academic establishment. And uh, despite the fact that other, there were very interesting things came out about the, the kingdom of Akiatwa, the kings who were my equals in rank, the king of the Hittites, wrote, and even though Akiawa had been crossed out, that was something. And conflict between the king of Akiawa and the Hittites, hostilities have broken up. And even the matter of Wilusa, about which we were hostile, about which we were in conflict even, the common sense reading of these documents from the 1920s onwards was that Wilusa was Troy and that the Greeks and the Hittites are corresponding about this event or a series of similar events, but it was rejected, rejected. Um, whilst people argued about the, the geography of the Hittite empire and that long and difficult argument has only just been resolved from the late 1990s by scholars like David Hawkins. So uh, here's a map with the heartland of the Hittite Empire and, and uncertainty about where, where and what Akiawa was. Meantime, the Americans went back to Troy. Found more pillared houses and The entrance on the south side was cleared. Can you see the upright stones on, on a kind of podium on the left-hand side of the gateway? Um, Carl Blagan thought that images of the Trojan gods would have been on those as he went into the city. And Blagan also found that all through the city, um, in, in a later phase, towards 1200, he believed, 
uh, storage vases, jars had been put everywhere, as if the city was under siege, as if um, the whole economic conditions of the place had changed dramatically. Um, and by now the pottery dating was starting to solidify. The beautiful city discovered by Derpfeld had had a violent destruction soon after 1300. And then the, a violent destruction of a much more jerry-built, crammed with refugees city had happened um, as Blagan had discovered around 1200, but now thought to be later still. Um, so those were the two possible, two possible dates for the Trojan War, but nothing certain. In the meantime, uh, one of the most important of all discoveries was made, and that is that the language found on the clay tablets in the Greek palaces turned out to be Greek. I know it sounds incredible that people thought that it wasn't, but they followed the old narrative of the Greeks' arrival uh, after the fall of the late Bronze Age, the Dorians and so on in the Iron Age. And instead, tablets that had turned up at Knossos and Mycenae and other places now gave us the full picture that Mycenae and Greece was indeed Greek. And soon, with the decipherment, you could even see that the, the continuity of Greek culture back into the Bronze Age. Atana Potnia, Athene, Artemito, Artemis, Poseidon, Poseidon, Enuario, Enualios, God of War, and so on. And all kinds of other um, things came out on these tablets. Um, the stuff ex excavated at Pylos gave us the military order of individual palaces, in this case, Pylos. Hundreds of rowers manning the boats. Um, probably 60 or 70, maybe upwards of 100 chariots. In a, in a great palace. Here's a little passage of Greek from, from Pylos, rowers to go to Pleuron being, being listed. So a whole other dimension came out of the decipherment of Linear B in the next 20 years. And uh, with little hints of war in Anatolia. And one of the most interesting were these places which revealed women textile workers or women captives being taken from places in Anatolia back to work on plantations in Greece. From Knidos, Zephyros, which is an old name for Halicarnassos, Miletus, Chios, Lemnos, Asiwia, which is the original form, Asua in Hittite, Asia. The original of the word Asia is actually um, the Anatolian coast south of Troy and possibly even Toroja. So I'm skipping through this, but to give you a sense of what a revelation came with the decipherment of Linear B. Now we come to the modern excavations. This was the situation when we made our films in 1985, and Manfred Kaufman then decided he was going to go back, and here's what they found. This is Kaufman's map of Troy. And the little citadel at the top is what Derpfeld had, had drawn in that map I showed you earlier. And the red lines snaking down, the blue lines of the Roman and classical city with the grid pattern of the Roman city. But the, uh, the red line is the defensive ditch and palisade of late Bronze Age Troy. So the city, Troy did have a lower city. Manfred Kaufman thought, thought somewhere between five and 10,000 people could have been living in it, with the citadel just for the, uh, the royal family, perhaps. There's the citadel, as we now understand it, adding to what Dirkvold found. 
probably about 20 houses, a palace and a temple, um, the pillared hall at the, near the gate, it was thought was a temple, but recent, very recent discoveries have w wondered whether it was actually for textile manufacture, interestingly enough. And this is what Troy looked like. The stone walls, sloping stone walls with a mud brick superstructure, none of which survives, of course. It's great, isn't it? You would never have... There's the bastion that I showed you in the black and white photo from Dirtfell, with its superstructure in mud brick. And another fabulous discovery that they made was that the Bay of Troy, well, that the Plain of Troy wasn't there in the late Bronze Age. But just like the meander at Miletus, this was a, a, a river system which had gradually silted up. And the um, test cores that they took show that's the shoreline in the 13th century BC at the time of the Trojan War, if such a war took place. So Troy was on a huge bay like that. So, the last question. What do we now know about could there have been a war? What do those Hittite tablets actually say? Um, let's skip the pottery dating. We know enough about that. Um, almost all the tablets which refer to the Greeks, and we now it's now accepted by the scholars that the Achaeans are the um, the Greeks. The, uh, the Achaeans are the Achaewia in in Hittite. And um, the story, almost all these, the references occur in a 50 year period from about 1300 onwards. And how the Greeks, who'd had quite a long involvement with Western Anatolia, but not systematic, if you like, not, not really predatory, but engagement with colonies on the shore, things change in 1319 and 1318 BC with the campaign by the Hittite emperor Mursilis all the way to the Aegean. And this is wonderfully documented um, campaign with two sets of annals describing the journey, the extraordinary visions and omens which accompanied the march, how they saw a meteor fall going out to the west and falling on the capital of the Azawan state with a Western Anatolian state how the Hittite army drove down to the coast, how they defeated the Azawans, who were the Western Anatolians, and uh, um, pursued them on Mount Arinanda, which is Mikale, you know, the wonderful mountain opposite Samos, uh, which the Hittites described as sticking right into the sea. And in those days, with the Meander River not silted up, it would have gone about four miles into the sea. And... Uh, the whole campaign is described in fantastic detail. At this point, um, the, um, the Hittites reach the, uh, reach the Aegean and consolidate their power, conquer Miletus, defend Miletus with a system of walls, and are looking out across the bay there to the mountains of Samos. There's the, there's the hills and slopes of Mikale that the Hittite army, the ground was too rough and too wooded for chariots, the Hittite emperor says, and I led my forces up on foot. We took 16,000 prisoners, sent them back to Hattusa. And for the first time, a power based in central Anatolia and in Asia it's actually consolidated itself looking out across to the islands. And the royal family of the Azawan state, which is the main state in Western Anatolia, take refuge in the islands with the king of the Greeks. 
Mursilis organizes, reorganizes the coastal regions there. Azawa proper is capital, Apasa, Ephesus. The Seha River land, corresponding roughly to Lydia, classical Lydia, and Willusa, Troy. So that's a new security system laid out by the Hittite emperor. These are states bound to him by treaties, and the treaties survive. And the one with Wilusa is intact as a document. Uh, these are defense and offense treaties. If you are attacked, I, your lord, will come and defend you. And uh, uh, that's the system that Mursilis put in in 1319-1318. But when Mursilis died in 1295, the situation changes. His son Muatali replaces him. And this is the moment when the royal family in exile in Greece take the opportunity to return to their homeland and try to win their patrimony back and restore the kingdoms in Western Anatolia. And Muatali is worth a mention here because although we think that the Hittites have completely forgotten in the Greek record, Muatali has a few little references which still survive in Greek literature. I've just chosen a couple of them here. Um, a monument recorded by Hipponax of Ephesus in you know, 500 BC. He was still aware that uh, uh, the people who told him what this monument read were still aware of the great king. Um, and much later, but using earlier sources, Stephanos of Byzantium tells the story of a town in Western Anatolia founded by Muatali, who sheltered Helen and Paris. So some suggestion that some distant tradition, that it was in the time of Muatali that these events had taken place. And a third reference one might add to this is the recent suggestion by Anatolian philologists that the chief town of Lesbos, Mytilene, actually the name derives from the name Muatali, and that the fortress of Mytilene was, was, um, was um, founded by the Hittites when they reconquered Lesbos. So this is now closing in on what likely happens. The Azawan royal family, on the death of Mursilis, and the accession of Muatali choose this moment of indecision to come back to Miletus. Take Miletus, they move up the coast, they conquer the Seha river land and, and, and impose a, a puppet king over the, the king of the Seha land. And they go on and take Lesbos and they move to attack Willusa, Troy. Just to remind you of how close these things are, there's the, there's the land of Troy just over the strait from Lesbos, Laspa. It's one of the, I think, two or three references to Lesbos in the Hittite records, the only Greek island, I think, that is referred to by name. And, uh, and there, just for, your, uh, just for your information, the former island, which is now part of the mainland at uh, Mytilene, on the right. Originally, that, that strait was a strait, and very likely that's where the Hittites built their, their fortress when they reconquered it. Then comes a letter from the king of the Greeks to the king of the Hittites. In the previous year, my brother wrote to me as follows. The Hittite king says, I did not take from you any of your islands. Your islands, which you call your inheritance, from the king of Asuwa, the storm god gave them to me as subjects. Now the king of Asuwa was on good terms with the king of the Greeks, king of the Achaeans. So his great grandfather, Kagamuna, previously married his daughter. A little bit of uncertainty over who marries who at this point, but the general gist is clear. Then Tudhalia, your great grandfather, defeated the king of Asuwa and subjugated him, but the islands indeed formerly belonged to the king of Akiawa. They're Greek, 
So there is a, this fantastically interesting letter, fragmentary, but nonetheless, uh, reading between the lines, you can see the king of the Greeks is actually in, in, in a dispute with the king of the Hittites uh, over, um, over their claims over Lesbos. The Hittites launched their attack to respond. Maybe eight or ten weeks to get an army out to Troy, by which time everything perhaps had already fallen. A little moment on the way, somewhere in Lydia, the capital of the Seha Riverland, the king writes to the king of the Hittites, at the moment all is calm. Gasu, your general, has arrived with the Hittite army. When they went to attack Troy, I was ill. He goes on and on about his illness. He's obviously trying to excuse his inaction. When they went to attack Troy, I was ill. They humbled me and they went on to attack Lesbos. All of this early in the reign of Muatali, 1290 BC. Greek troops on the mainland, even illustrated on Hittite ceramics. The upshot for these events is slightly unclear because of the fragmentary nature of the sources. And the crucial source, the Tawagalawa letter, um, may be Muatali, but Trevor Bryce assures me is now most people think that it's Hattusili, his, his, um, his son. But um, it doesn't alter the basic picture. At the moment, all is calm. Gasu has come. They went on to attack Lesbos. Um, yeah. So was there a war? If the Greeks were aiding their, their proxy kings, the royal family of Azawa, what actually happened? And is there any trace of this in the Greek sources? Well, um, now we come to the topography and whether there are any clues in the, hit, in the Homeric text that give us a little purchase. This is Beshika Bay, um, which I pointed out earlier. It's, can you see bottom left? If there was no plain of Troy in the late Bronze Age, where did the Greeks where did the Greek fleet moor if they did launch an operation against Wilusa, as our text suggests they did? Um, well, Beshika Bay is the obvious place all the way through history. There it is. You can see it's still a fantastic uh, a wide bay today. Homer says the Greek fleet was moored between two in a wide bay between two headlands. And that bay was used all the way through history because uh, with the currents down the Dardanelles, you often had to wait sometimes even weeks before you could get up the Dardanelles. Uh, and you could find any number of illustrations. This is from the British campaign in the Crimea in the 1850s of huge fleets mooring in Bashika Bay with temporary camps growing up with restaurants and uh, all, all the rest. Right by the side of Beshika Bay, famous tumulus, which Greek tradition said was the tomb of Achilles, back to the archaic period. And the dig that Kaufman began there actually uncovered Mycenaean uh, cremations with the seal stones of Mycenaean aristocrats. And then, now we get to the real nitty gritty, and I do think this is a Fascinating clue. Do you remember at the beginning I spoke about the, the Homer's account of a, the Stoma Limne, the pool at the shore, that the Greek camp was partly protected by a lagoon, a Stoma Limne. Um, and unbelievably, the soil cores in Beshika Bay have revealed that, you can see the date there, around the time of 1500 to 1000 BC, there was indeed a lagoon 
behind Beshika Bay. But not in Homer's time. Let's look again at the map that Dirkfeld drew. The Stoma Limne, of course, there's no, the, the plane isn't there. What about the Thros Moss? Well, if you, if you change his map to what we now know, this is what it would look like. The Thros Moss is a very pronounced rise coming up from the Beshika Bay. Uh, so Im important a landmark that there's still an Ottoman watchtower on top of it today where signaling could be done from the shore to the, uh, to the Dardanelles. So there was such a feature. And indeed, you can't see Troy from the other side of the Throsmos, and you can't see um, the area of the Greek camp. And if you went on, of course, what Dirk felt and everybody had forgotten, that the river is a major feature in the Homer story. The Greeks keep having to cross it to, to attack Troy. And in fact, there's a, and even in the summer, it's quite an obstacle. And, uh, oh, God, am I, I'm losing things here, but never mind. And Homer has this phrase, the bridges of war, which classicist Stephen Rees has analyzed as a very ancient formula and wonders whether the, the reference is really to siege causeways and embankments. And that leads you to the citadel of Troy. The blue walls are what um, uh, Manfred Kaufmann has now uncovered, the outer city wall. And you can see if you approach from this side, if you were going to follow the Dirtbelt's romantic interpretation of everything else, you would immediately come to the great tower, which is the, the biggest landmark architecturally of, of Troy. And, uh, and the Skian gate, the left-hand gate, there were two gates. The other one would lead to Dardanos. So um, has the oral tradition come down through Homer, remembered, even when people said it was meaningless, that there was a pool behind the shore, that there was a Throsmos over which you had to march before you could see Troy, and that when you got to Troy, you saw the great Tower of Ilion. So, to sum up, um, I think there were many wars of Troy, going back to probably 15th century BC. The Greeks had a long involvement with that part of the coast. Um, but this, to me, looks like a real confrontation, even though the fragmentary nature of the Hittite letters doesn't quite confirm the picture that you intuit from it. Muatali, accession in 1295, and then the leader of the Azawan people who'd been dispossessed by Mursilis comes back from overseas, from his exile in the islands, as the Hittites say, with the Greeks, and invades Azawa on the Aegean coast, retakes Miletus, and, um, and then goes up towards Troy. They attack with Lyusa. The Greeks are his supporters. The attack on the islands includes Lesbos. The Hittite army under Gassu defeats Piyamaradu, the leader of Azawa, and Wilyusa is recaptured. And, um, uh, and the treaty of Muatali with King Alexander of Wilyusha uh, afterwards specifically says, not only will you come to help me, but I will come to help you if you are attacked by enemies. And just as I did when your enemies attacked you, and I sent an army and killed them. So there's clear picture there, reading between the lines, of a real event, of a real war. And, uh, and I'm sure more is to come when further Hittite archives are opened up. The discovery of the, 
the Hittite capital at Tarantassa has it's only just been identified and there may be an archive there. So those are the sort of events that perhaps the Bard sang songs about. They don't have to be, it doesn't have to be a great event to, um, uh, to be the occasion of song. You know, we've only got to look at Western Bardic tradition to see that. But something in this meant the Greeks especially remembered it. And it may be it was one of their great expeditions at this time. It would be sung first of all by the bards, uh, finally composed by Homer, finally written down sixth century perhaps in Athens, and has come down to us in great manuscripts like the, the Venice manuscript of a thousand. It's a long and tortuous tradition, but um, behind the tale, I think, is a real war. Thank you. Now, Zeta says we haven't got time for questions. We must have drinks. But uh, I'm very open to questions if anybody wants to, uh, to buttonhole me. Yeah, okay. Thank you, Michael. Splendid presentation, very informative. And I would like to invite uh, uh, Professor Antonio Macrinos to give the vote of thanks. Antonio Macrinos is uh, Associate Professor uh, in Classics at uh, UCL. He's a Homeric Studies expert, uh, a friend and a compatriot of the late Matt Egan. Thank you, Zeta, and thank you, Michael. What a wonderful talk. Um, so as you have heard, my name is Andrew Macrinos. I'm a Homerist, and I should add a Homeroholic. Um, I have the honor and great pleasure of giving the vote of thanks on behalf of all of us, lovers of Homer and his poetry, to our distinguished speaker, Michael Wood, who has enlightened us with so many inspiring insights about the true story of the Trojan War tonight. Uh, for me personally, it is the greatest of pleasures, as I remember vividly being introduced to the delights of Michael's insights about the Trojan War uh, in the 90s, when I was a student of classics at the University of Athens and then at UCL in London, through, of course, the legendary documentary In Search of the Trojan War. Um, six hours of joy for all Homerists there. Um, uh, I also had the privilege to know Matty Egon, who we both share common origins from the beautiful island of Hios. Yes, this is the island where the Anatolian women were taken to, to were taken as we saw to weave. Um, and by the way, it's one of the seven birthplaces of Homer. Um, I'm a bit biased about all this. It's all connected. Um, I'm certain that um, Matty would have immensely enjoyed this talk, as it is well known that she has been a great admirer of Homer and his poetry. She could recite whole passages to me off by heart with an intonation and rhythm of ancient Greek that left me many times speechless and deeply moved. Um, and I'm internally grateful to Matty for so many things, uh, but above all, my love and passion for Homer. Um, now, as a good Homerist, let me start from uh, Homer, who in Book 2 of the Iliad acknowledges the immense task ahead of him when he tries to enumerate um, all the leaders and the numbers of ships of the, of the Achaeans. He says it is an impossible task, um, and even if he had ten tongues and ten mouths, he could not tell over the multitude of the Greeks and their ships. And that's why he asks for the help of the Olympian muses. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I hope that the muses this evening are listening, because even if, if I had ten tongues and ten ma uh, mouths, I would not be able to recite to you the multitude of Michael Wood's books, speeches, television series, documentaries, lectures, online discussions, and social media interactions about not only Homer, but the history of the world. So, Michael, the whole world, and especially we as Greeks, are eternally grateful for your work. Um, and this is why I'm confident that the muse will inspire me to give you a concise um, and very brief summary of what we have learned tonight. Uh, so, Michael has shared with us 
everything about the discoveries of Troy. Um, he argued convincingly that uh, the narrative was already set uh, with very convincing references to topography, uh, archaeology. We have seen um, the excavations of Schliemann and Calbert. Uh, he addressed one of the biggest questions in the Homeric studies about what Schliemann has actually destroyed and what he actually found um, in his romantic quest for Troy. Um, he has given us a glimpse of what the historical Bronze Age Troy would have looked like. He has encouraged us to reflect on the relationship between the Mycenaean Greeks and the empire of the Hittites, um, together with the correspondences between Greek and Hittite texts, which are becoming more and more important uh, for us. I find astonishing that historically we might have uh, a conflict about Vilusa. Um, and uh, all the details about the reorganization of Western Anatolia by the Hittites, you know, is simply amazing. Um, was there a war or were there many wars uh, over Troy? Um, these are all uh, very important questions that I'm sure that we will be talking uh, about those questions in the, in the years to come. Ladies and gentlemen, Homer's world is not a distant world from the past. Um, it's not a world which is irrelevant to us. It is our world. Homer is without doubt, in my mind, at least, the best poet who ever lived, because in his world he talks about our emotions, our success and failure, our human tragedy of war and death, our journey of life, and our Ithacas. In other words, he talks about human condition. We are all Achilles and we excel, we are all Hector and we fail, we are all Odysseus and we travel and return. This talk has been a wonderful learning experience for all of us in order to explore the latest historical and archaeological evidence that relates to the tale of the Trojan Wars. I hope you have enjoyed it as much as I have. I'd like to extend our heartfelt appreciation to Michael for enriching our historical knowledge of the Homeric world. Homer's works are deeply embedded in our collective memory and psyche. They have always been and will always be with us, traveling from morality and clay tablets to papyrus, from manuscript to paper, and to the digital era and beyond. I request you to join me in giving a big round of applause to our speaker and to the organizers of the Greek Archaeological Committee UK for this fantastic talk. Thank you very much. Yes, it's me again, sorry. <laughs> well, uh, I thank both of our speakers and I would like to thank you all for joining us. Uh, I'm afraid we won't have uh, Q&A in that sense, but please join us for uh, uh, some drinks and nibbles. There's a reception at the back of the room and you'll have the opportunity to uh, meet our speaker and all of us and our scholars. If you or any of you are interested in our activities, please visit our website and please join us and support us. Thank you very much for coming this evening. Thank you.